Let me know if you can hear anything. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, the online child protection workshop uh, convened by the Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum. My name is Lara Pace, and I work for the Comnet Foundation. The Comnet Foundation um, runs the Commonwealth Internet Governance Forum and also the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. Uh, th this workshop is focused on updates on the Online Child Protection Toolkit, which we presented at the IGF in Vilnius. Um, the toolkit is the brainchild of um, John Carr and also the work of Sandra from ICMEC. Um, and this workshop is going to address the changes in the model legislation, the sixth version of the model legislation produced by ICMEC. And we will be, will be publishing this uh, on our CIGF website by the end of this year. Can you hear me? Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to just give each panelist a five minute um, introduction so that they can explain to you why they're here and how they work with the Commonwealth. And then we'll have more of an interactive discussion. There won't be any presentations. And we'll start with a few questions and then open the questions to the floor. Yep. Okay, so we're going to start with um, Sandra Marchenko from the International Center of Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, Sandra has been working with the Commonwealth for three years now. And um, she's going to update you on the changes from the sixth edition of the model legislation to the seventh. Thank you. Okay. I'll apologize. I'm losing my voice. So if you can't hear me, please just tell me. Can you hear? Yeah? Okay. Far away. So as Laura mentioned, my name is Sandra Marchenko, and I'm with the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. We're an international NGO, but we're based in the Washington, D.C. area. The toolkit project is something that we've been working on together with John Carr and with the Commonwealth for a few years now. A part of this toolkit, and, and John will go into more detail about this, is our model legislation, which is one of our projects. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of generally what we do, and then we'll go into more detail about the, the model legislation itself. So the International Center was created in the late 1990s to address issues internationally that were happen happening around sexual exploitation of children and missing children, so specifically missing and abduction. We are the sister organization of the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which is the U.S. clearinghouse for these issues. We run a number of different initiatives that range anywhere from research initiatives, um, including work on child pornography model legislation online, online child grooming, um, we have child protection model legislation, and a number of other pieces as well. We also do law enforcement training on computer facilitated crimes uh, all around the world. We just rolled out a new global health initiative to look at the sexual abuse and exploitation of children as a public health issue. So that's only been rolled out about three weeks ago, so we'll be seeing more movement on that front soon. We also help to run the Financial Coalition Against Child Pornography, which is an, an industry um, initiative. It's a partnership between industry, law enforcement, and then NGOs that work in this arena. We help with this initiative in the United States, but we also have created a similar initiative in Asia Pacific and work with the European Initiative in an advisory capacity. We also um, work on, like I said, missing children's issues. So we have a global missing children's network. Um, and the number of initiatives that go with that. So that's just kind of a quick overview. Um, do, do you want me to go into any more detail now? Okay, and then we can go into more specifics about what is the model legislation and the criteria and the Commonwealth numbers with the questions. Thank you, Sandra. Um, now I'm gonna, I have the pleasure to introduce John Carr. Some of you have already, um, might have already heard him speak earlier today. And um, John, over yeah. to you. Um, yeah, w uh, we were speaking earlier today on a, a much broader range of issues than 
the one that we're specifically going to focus on uh, today. Um, although the question of child abuse images, child pornography, did did come up um, in one of those earlier sessions. Uh, I'm not going to speak at any length about the toolkit. I'll assume most of you have seen it. Or if you haven't seen it, it's very easily available online. It's a very, very good, useful, practical document. Uh, and it's aimed specifically, and this was, this was the whole idea really behind developing it in the first place. When we looked around the world to see what countries hadn't implemented even very basic laws to deal with child abuse images, what we discovered to our horror, and I'm speaking here as a Brit, uh, specifically, was that a very large proportion of those countries were in fact in the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth, although for those of you who weren't fortunate enough to be subjected to British imperialism, uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the Commonwealth, it's a great big club. Um, it's a great big club with a lot of contact and interchange between them. So we saw as child protection people uh, a great opportunity to work with the Commonwealth as an institution to try and get more and more countries, mainly in the developing world, to take up this question of child abuse images. Um, and it was great to work with ICMEC, who do some fantastic work in, in this uh, space around the world, and develop that toolkit. Since the, um, since the toolkit was first presented in Vilnius, uh, and we had a kind of a review of this in Kenya last year, the European Union has now finally finished with the new directive. It was finally adopted and became law in December 2011. So now every country in the European Union before December 2013 has to implement a whole set of laws to make sure that they've got some basic standards in place to deal with child abuse images. And those standards, by the way, comply, are entirely in line with uh, ICMEX model legislation and the things that are put out in the in the Commonwealth Toolkit uh, document. In relation to the question of blocking, which I know always comes up when we discuss these questions, uh, the final position taken in the directive was that they did not make blocking of child abuse images mandatory, but they did establish it as an option that individual countries could, could adopt if they wanted to. Uh, so not mandatory, but there is an option. Um, our, our basic view, or one of the basic views that we've always had from the child protection space is if governments and if the pol uh, police don't understand the importance and central kind of role <coughs> of child abuse in the whole cycle of children's use of, uh, of the internet, it's very, very unlikely that they're going to get or understand many of the other more complicated or more difficult uh, questions that we have to face in this area. So our view has always been it's very very important in any and every country to make sure that the legal, the legislation and the police powers and so on at least in relation to this topic are completely clear and well resourced and well implemented because as I said if you can't get if a country can't get this right I'm not sure what else they can get right because this is such a clear cut uh, black and white sort of issue. Um, of course, uh, I'm trying to anticipate to some degree some of the issues that might come up later. We would all rather live in a world where the abuse of children didn't happen in the first place. And in many, many ways that is far, far more important to tackle and focus on. But child abuse images are one of the products or consequences of that abuse. So even if we can't stop the abuse taking place in the first place, which is what we would all dearly want, it's it doesn't mean we shouldn't give attention just as seriously to dealing with the consequences of that abuse, the images, because they perpetuate the humiliation of the child uh, and they do many, uh, many, many other things. And I think people forget this, but let, it's a very, very important to remember the great majority of children who are sexually abused, there, there are never any images made of it. There's never any videos made of it. It's, it's a, a minority of children who are sexually abused where the images are produced and then published and distributed over the internet. So, so just again to underline the point, this is not about, uh, this is part of addressing the, the original crime of the abuse of children, but more particularly it's about trying to tackle the humiliation and the consequences of that crime, which 
not only put the children in the images at risk and are an invasion of their privacy, but by continuing to allow them to circulate on the internet, they help sustain paedophile networks, they help sustain further exchanges of the images, and in that way, they put more children at risk in the future. Um, I'm hoping in the course of the discussion later on we can talk about peer-to-peer -peer because I think that's a whole area that we're going to have to start focusing on in the near future because that certainly has not been adequately dealt with up to now. Thank you, John, for the overview. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Fred Langford from the Internet Watch Foundation. Fred has been working with the Commonwealth now for the past couple of months and he's going to um, uh, introduce what IWF can do for the Commonwealth. Yes. Hello. I'm going to take these off. Um, yes, my name is Fred Langford. I'm director of an organisation, IWF International, and I'm also uh, president of INHOPE, the International Hotline Association. Um, what uh, IWF International can offer to the Commonwealth Initiative is uh, an operational and practical solution. So I'll give you a bit of a background about who the Internet Watch Foundation are. Uh, we are the UK body for um, and members of the public and industry to report uh, instances of online child sexual abuse content globally. <coughs> what we do is we trace the location, we work with industry, government and law enforcement to have the content removed at source, therefore um, stopping the re-victimisation of the children in, in the images. Um, my role as president of InHope is, um, as part of InHope are the umbrella organization for all the hotlines and there are uh, 42 hotlines in 37, 37 different countries around the globe um, and so th and what InHope do is, is um, provide a standardization to a certain level and best practice models for um, the different hotlines around the globe. Now to come into IWF International what, what we can offer um, the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative is a means by which um, members of the public in any country can report via a front-end reporting page straight into the Internet Watch Foundation's um, team of analysts to assess the content, trace, and then work with the wider network to, to have the content removed. So it's really that element that we're working here uh, with, with the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is... a. Uh uh, like an excellent combination between uh, having ECMEC and IWF work together is perfect, I think. And that is really the purpose of this workshop. Um, so I would like to introduce you to Mr. Tracy Hackshaw. And uh, Tracy is just going to give us a Caribbean perspective on online child protection. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Lara. So um, I'm Tracy Hackshaw. I'm the vice chair of the Internet Society, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and also an Internet Society Ambassador at this IGF. So when Lara and Jasper asked me to, to do something on this, I thought it was very interesting because um, we're two very small islands in the Caribbean, just off the coast of South America, um, 1.3 million people. Yet, uh, when you check the, the stats, um, we're quite heavy um, consumers of pornography as a country. Um, it's not unique to the, the region. Um, other islands are very similar. Um, there's quite a healthy dose of mobile penetration in the region. Um, in our country, it's 140% and growing. And what's happening is that these mobile devices that are emerging are landing in the hands of young people, as a, as a, as a rule, tweens and teens. Uh, we've had quite a number of cases of um, in school video, porno, um, small pornographic videos being made, um, circulating online and um, embarrassing um, the subjects. Uh, we've had a, a Facebook phenomenon in Trinidad as, as the rest of the world. And these, these kinds of things are starting to emerge now as new issues, which our legislation can't deal with. So when something happens in um, these areas, whether it be mobile or other online, it's very difficult to, to prosecute something like that. Like, how do you prosecute a young person filming another young person, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, in some sort of um, compromising position? Um, we also have cases of cyberbullying emerging in, in, in our country. Um, and we do have pockets of abuse in, in, in some ways um, that happen online. 
um, from where we sit, it's, uh, we have a Children's Act, and uh, that really to start Children's Authority, but that treats only with things like children's homes, um, institutions, and so on, but nothing to, spe to speak specifically to child protection. On the cybercrime side, we are uh, very new in that field. In fact, we're working with the Commonwealth to try and establish some sort of harmonized legislation that we can work on child protection within the cybercrime um, portfolio. However, it's not yet at a stage where we can say that children are protected. It's, it's very new areas in, in the region, um, and it's growing rapidly on a, on a daily basis. We are seeing more and more cases in the newspapers and so on. So it's, uh, it's something that we are very interested in, in this, these toolkits. And we are hoping that in some way we can learn from the experiences of other countries um, and what we can do in terms of um, your hotline um, approach to life. Um, if there's anything that we can, we can learn from that or implement in our countries, we, we'll be very willing to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, we are meant to have uh, a, a member of the Kenyan government join us and give uh, uh, an African perspective. Um, would you, uh, did you say you were going to cover it in the questions? Yeah? The African perspective. Yeah? No? Okay. Um, well, Alice is uh, stuck. So um, we're just going to open the questions part and we're just going to uh, miss out on this African perspective section. And um, I just want to start with you, Sandra. Um, what have been the notable um, changes from the toolkit that we submitted in, uh, in 2010 um, to now? Oh, it didn't work, sorry, there we go. Um, this was the original toolkit, just in the print form, um, that was rolled out in 2010. Part of the toolkit is our model legislation, which was the sixth edition model legislation on child pornography. We are working now towards the seventh edition of this report with the hopes that it will be ready at the end of the year so that we can relaunch the toolkit with the updated information. Um, before I talk about the notable changes, I'll just quickly explain what the model legislation is. Um, the way that the model legislation is laid out and, and the purpose for us having even started this project, um, clearly there's a need for countries' legislation to address the issues of child sex abuse images online, or child pornography as we term it, um, because the U.S. legislation is, is still using that terminology, um, though we're seeing, we're hoping to shift away from that terminology ourselves, <laughs> to make note of that. Um, the, the process itself is, or the way the report is structured, it is um, a country-by-country country analysis of where their legislation stands on five key criteria. And hand-in-hand hand with that, there's a list of, or we call a menu of concepts. So it's not a traditional model law in many ways. It offers some recommendations on the types of things that we believe should be included in legislation on this issue. The criteria that we look at are fairly basic in many ways. Uh, the first criteria is simply, is there legislation that is specific to child pornography to address the issue specifically? So not just banning all pornography or adult pornography, but banning child pornography specifically. Second, we look to see if they're defining the term child pornography. Is the simple possession, the simple knowing possession of child pornography criminalized? Are computer facilitated offenses also criminalized? And the last point, which is right now one of the most complicated and likely will never be adopted broadly, is ISP reporting mandated. So when an ISP becomes aware of content on their network, are they mandated to report it to an agency? So many countries take a different approach with that particular component, where it's a voluntary or some sort of other approach. And we accept that that is probably the case, um, or will be the case uh, for some time. So we, we generally believe that if they have at least the first four components, it's considered to be sufficient legislation to address the issue. So as far as the types of changes that we've seen since the 2010 toolkit, uh, which was in sync with our sixth edition, we've seen quite significant movement. Though I actually now have a question about Trinidad and, Tr and Tobago because we gave them in points that we'll discuss later. When we look at this report, because we are doing 
most of all of the research ourselves. We send what we find to the embassies for each country for verification, to ask that their legal counsel verify that what we have found is true. Obviously, there are cases where embassies or legal staff or even for our law enforcement contacts were unable to verify. So this report is always evolving and changing. So there's certainly information in here that can always be updated and changed. So in a case when a country sees that, you know, maybe we've said that they have no legislation and in fact they, they do have legislation, it's as simple as just talking to me, showing me the legislation and we'll go through it and see. And we, we would like to make sure that this toolkit is always as up to date as possible because it's, it's a resource for countries um, not only in the Commonwealth but all around the world to be able to share their practices, the kind of terminology they're using in their legislation um, so that we can also help harmonize the legislation across the regions. Um, in the 2010 toolkit, we saw about um, 11 countries that had what were four to five of the criteria. For this new edition, it looks to be we have about 21 or 22 countries now that have four to five criteria. So it's almost double the number of countries from just two years ago. So it's a significant increase. Um, just, and this is specifically to the Commonwealth as we haven't completed all 196 countries in the review phase just yet. We show about 17 countries that don't have any of the criteria yet. So there's certainly work that still needs to be done um, and about 15 countries that fall somewhere in the middle between one to three. So we, we believe it to be good progress, significant progress, and it, sh and it shows a, sort of an awakening on the issue that countries are really understanding that it's an issue, but certainly much more to be done. But I think also it's, Im it's important to say the very fact that ICMEC take all of the, take the time and go to all of the trouble to produce this document and publish it in itself is a spur to some countries to change things because those countries that see themselves with zero out of five, so in other words, absolutely no laws at all to deal with child pornography on the internet, I think it's, in my opinion, I'm pretty sure some ministers, when they saw that, they thought, blimey, I had no idea that we were so out of line with everybody else. So just producing this document in itself, even without anything else, is a great contribution because it draws attention to something that I think very often politicians were just not aware of. Um, I have a question for Fred. Um, I understand that, uh, you know, InHope is extremely active in quite a few of the Commonwealth countries. Um, but in terms of the reporting mechanism that you have just run us through, uh, I don't think that IWF is um, active in any of the Commonwealth countries as we were discussing. What are your ideas on being able to encourage these reporting mechanisms? So, in line with the good news that Sandra has um, just told us about how can IWF international um, support the, the improvement? Thank you, Lauren. Um, yes, some countries, some Commonwealth countries do have their own standalone hotline. So I'd use um, Australia as an example via their um, media authority. So um, we work with um, the IWF, work with the Australian um, hotline via InHope because there's a need for a hotline to report into that country. Uh, talking about what uh, Sandra is saying is that many countries um, don't have the legislation in place at the moment, but some do. But what we're able to offer at IWF International is just the means by which their citizens can actually report somewhere. So at the moment they can't report in many of the countries to anybody. They could, they could report to law enforcement, but law enforcement don't necessarily have the skills on the ground to be able to tackle the problem immediately. So IWF International is a relatively new initiative um, and we're partnering with, with the Commonwealth because there's a common law amongst the Commonwealth generally about what, what child sexual abuse actually is. Um, and so what we're able to offer is a means by which a country can keep its own branding, its own, its own front end um, as part of their overall um, approach to tackling this sort of content. And as soon as they um, press send on, on the actual reporting um, button, they'll be able to send the report straight through to an established hotline. Um, the Internet Watch Foundation have been operational now for 16 years. Um, 
we've taken a huge number of reports. We've, we've taken action against uh, nearly 50,000 URLs in 60, uh, 16 years to have the content removed. And we've managed to get the removal time down to, um, in the UK, less than an hour on average. But uh, internationally, we've managed to push it down to, to less than 48 hours, generally less than 24 hours. Now, if you think if you're a citizen in, in uh, a Commonwealth country that doesn't have this solution in place, that you could, you could continue to see this content for month after month because the content isn't being reported. So law enforcement can't take any action because they wouldn't necessarily know about it. Um, and whereas the Internet Watch Foundation have the established network of links to be able to take, take action. Thank you, Fred. Um, John, you, were, you just touched on peer-to-peer. -peer. Do you want to um, yeah. contribute? Uh, thank, thanks, to thanks to the work of um, the Internet Watch Foundation um, in, in the UK and, and in hope globally, I'm feel pretty confident or feel pretty sure that we can deal with child abuse images that are being found on the on the web on, on the World Wide Web that's what the IWF was set up to do actually it was set up to deal with the web and Usenet news groups and certainly within the UK at any rate it's pretty pretty comprehensively dealt with it I mean you'd have to be a complete idiot uh, to, to post any child abuse images on a, on a UK uh, based website or a UK based Usenet news group because it will be gone it will be gone within within the hour what we do now know however within the UK and therefore I suspect it's also true more widely is we've completely and absolutely failed uh, to deal with the publication and distribution of these images over peer-to-peer -peer networks and I'll illustrate that with some uh, facts um, let, let's take 1995 as year zero. Yeah? Year zero was 1995. So 1995 was when Microsoft first published Internet Explorer. Uh, and that was more or less the moment when you began to see a gigantic, you know, the big leap in the use of the Internet amongst the mass of the, of the public, consumer space. The Internet finally arrived in the consumer space. In, in that year, the, 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 the police force in Greater Manchester, which covers a very substantial population in the, in the north of England, they, they seized the grand total of 12 child pornographic images. 12, one, two, a dozen child pornographic images. Uh, at that time, the British police said that they were aware of the existence of 7,000 child pornographic images. They, they knew of the existence of 7,000 child pornographic images. Uh, Interpol at about the same time claimed that they knew about the existence of 4,000 images. So that was essentially the position that existed prior to the arrival uh, of the internet. Then the initial splurge and spread of the images was into Usenet news groups and then onto the web, which we have dealt with. Well, last month, last month uh, a British child protection organization called the NSPCC sent freedom of information requests, so these were legal requests to all 43 police forces in England and Wales. So not the whole of the United Kingdom, just England and Wales. And they asked these police forces to tell them how many child abuse images they had seized in official police actions in the preceding two years. Now, in the time available, of the 43 police forces that received these official legal requests, only five replied before the data was analyzed and published. Those five police forces, and by the way, they were mainly police forces covering country areas, not none of the big city areas, London wasn't included, Birmingham wasn't included, Manchester wasn't included, Leeds and the West Right, the Yorkshire wasn't included. So these five police forces from predominantly country areas in the previous two years had seized 26 million, 26 million uh, child abuse images. Now, a, the great majority, the overwhelming majority of those images were duplicates. There's no suggestion that that means that 26 million children were abused. There's no suggestion it was 26 unique images, nothing of the kind. But nonetheless, simply viewed from the point of view of the volumes that are now, now in circulation, that was a staggering number from only five out of our 43 uh, police forces. Now, 
Uh, it, uh, I spoke to a statistician who looked at the dem demographics of the five police force areas where these numbers had come from, and he said, well, because, and by the way, the, the, the people living in those five areas represented seven and a quarter percent of the entire population of England and Wales. So he said, if you were to ramp it up, if you were to assume that what's going on in those five force areas on the basis of population alone were to be repeated across England and Wales and there's no obvious reason why you should why it wouldn't be that would mean in that same period if all the police forces have, had had uh, replied the number would have been in the region of 360 million uh, child abuse images that had been seized by the police in official police actions over the two-year period even if you exclude from your calculations the smallest and the biggest numbers. So you take out of the five forces, get rid of the lowest, get rid of the highest, so you've got the three in the middle. The number still comes out at around about 200 million. And the point about these numbers is they're all going through peer-to-peer -peer networks. This is nothing, essentially nothing, to do with, uh, with the World Wide Web. Now, the Internet Watch Foundation has no locus. It has no role in relation to peer-to-peer -peer networks because the peer-to-peer -peer networks are not part of the public web. The IWF does a brilliant job in relation to the web and news groups, but they're part of the public web. Peer-to-peer -peer isn't. The police in England also uh, did an analysis of the numbers of people who were actively engaging in the exchange of these images. And to be honest, I'm not clear whether they looked at one peer-to-peer -peer network or several peer-to-peer -peer networks but let's assume for the moment that what they did was look at every peer-to-peer -peer network operational in Britain. It's very unlikely that they did but let's assume for the moment that they did. They looked at every peer-to-peer -peer network. What they found was between 50 and 60,000 people. They identified 50 to 60,000 different IP addresses on machines, on computers, in the United Kingdom that were being used to exchange these images. Now these are exceptionally high numbers, whichever way you look at it. We can argue what the numbers represent, we can argue what they mean. Some of the 50 to 60,000 guys who were doing this sort of exchange on the network, they might have only been exchanging one or two images. Some guys might have been exchanging millions. The, the numbers in and of themselves don't tell you very much, except it tells you about the scale on which this type of activity is taking place. A guy, one guy in possession of one image could be every bit as dangerous to a child tomorrow as a guy who had five million. There was one guy, by the way, in Cambridgeshire who was arrested in possession of five million images. That guy could have been less of a threat, potentially, to children, less of a danger to children in the future than a guy found with only one image. The numbers in themselves don't tell you anything about the level of dangers of the people involved but what they do tell you is that we are in a wholly new and different place and we've not dealt with it now this is not the internet's fault the technology is not to blame let's be completely clear about that but collectively somehow we've not dealt with this problem adequately and it's a continuing blot really on the reputation on the image it tarnishes everybody who's associated with the internet in a way because somehow collectively we haven't yet been able to find an answer to it. Um, Sandra, I just wanted to ask you a quick question on the financial coalition. Um, would you be able to just give a brief uh, explanation on that and the work revolving on that? Please. Thanks. Yeah, and then we'll uh, open up the floor for questions. Uh, so, Laura asked me if I would just give a quick mention about the Financial Coalition Against Child Pornography. The Financial Coalition um, initially started um, as a partnership between the National Center and the International Center in the U.S., um, but it has definitely expanded, expanded because of the need for it. The basic idea is that what we, what we seek to do is to stop the flow of funds for purchasing of these materials over the internet. So it is a coalition that is made up, and in each location that we work, it's slightly different, but it's primarily between leading banks, credit card companies, electronic payment companies and networks, third-party payment companies, 
and internet service providers in cooperation with our NGOs, but also working directly with law enforcement. So law enforcement, um, when they become aware of the use of a credit card or some other electronic payment fashion of, of these items being purchased, these images being purchased over the internet, law enforcement then is able to go in and do test transactions and other transactions to be able to find out who in fact is actually purchasing and who is selling. While the credit card companies are able to stop the payments and the ISPs are informed so that they can block the, the images themselves. So it is um, quite an interesting process and it's it's been working very well, at least in the United States. Right now, um, nearly 90% of the U.S. payments industry is represented in the U.S. coalition. Um, John will likely know more about the European coalition than I do. Uh, we work only in an advisory capacity for the European coalition, which has gone through some recent changes. Um, but we also have been working quite hard to establish a similar coalition in Asia Pacific. Right now, I know that at least four Commonwealth countries are actively involved in that process. Um, I can't tell you exactly how many countries because it is really, in the last two years, only started to develop. So it's growing and changing. Um, but we, we are seeing a lot of movement in the right direction with a lot of new industry partners, um, active law enforcement participation and otherwise. We also would like to see something similar happen in Latin America. It has been a much slower process there. And it, has, it seems to have been more focused on Brazil as far as interest level goes. Um, but right now, the other coalitions are far more active. Thank you. Um, we'd like to open up questions to the floor. Uh, do we have any questions? Any? Okay, we should have a microphone. Microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Right, my name is Ablash. I'm from Northumbria University in Newcastle. Um, what is your position regarding um, computer-generated child pornography? Um, the UK introduced a simple possession offence for um, any sexualized representation of a child, um, even as a cartoon, um, two years ago. And I know that the US position is slightly different to that. Um, so my first question is, what is your position regarding um, sexualized representation of children in a 100% non-photographic uh, manner? And secondly, uh, how do you reconcile uh, the approaches of different countries to this uh, particular issue? Thank you. Thank you. Just briefly, as far as the model legislation is concerned, it is not intended to be a U.S. model. It's not based on U.S. law. Um, so for, the, for our, our purposes, any image of a child in a sexualized situation like that would fall under our model legislation. It isn't about whether or not we agree with the way that U.S. legislation is written for, for this purpose. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so to be clear, within the model legislation, pseudo-images are covered. I don't think... I think this was drafted before the cartoons law was adopted in the UK and we haven't revisited it since, but it's something we should think about for sure. Uh, just to add to that, um, the Internet Watch Foundation, because it's a possession offence like you say, we, we can act on distribution if the content is hosted in the UK and we can work with a national centre in the States if it's hosted in the States, but because there's not a global uh, agreement on whether or not something's illegal. It means that in in real action, it just means that people move to a country where they can host it and it's still accessible. So that's the situation we're still in. But but John is is, is correct. It hasn't the, the CGI itself hasn't been revisited and possibly should be. Any other questions? Uh, microphone. Thank you. Coming. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Alexander Seger from Council of Europe. Uh, this issue of uh, realistic image, images or also of a person appearing to be a minor but being an adult 
uh, is covered to some extent in the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime and the Lanzarote Convention. Um, countries can make a reservation on these provisions because indeed there is no general agreement, but we strongly discourage states from making an exception to realistic images and persons appearing to be a minor. In this case, I want to mention something else we are, we are doing right now. Uh, we are carrying out an analysis of how, at the moment, about 50 countries have implemented in quite some detail the, the Lanzarote Convention and the Budapest Convention. The different provisions is not to be in competition to the uh, model law of ICMEC, but rather complementary. It provides much more details, the, not just the eight offenses, but also the different elements of the offenses to be covered. Uh, ISP reporting is not included, uh, but maybe we should also look into that in the future. Uh, but this is done also as a contribution to the legislative engagement strategy that Interpol and the Virtual Global Task Force adopted last year in November at the Interpol General Assembly in, in Vietnam. And we will present this, uh, the, the, the provisional version of our study in Abu Dhabi in December at the global conference of the Virtual Global Task Force. Mm -hmm. Just in case you're interested, I think you can find me. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alexander. I'm just going to um, run towards you and get the mic. Yeah, we've got a lady over there. Yeah. Over there. Thank you. This is the lady from the front. Hello. Uh, my name is Amelia Andersdotter. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the uh, uh, Pirate Party. Um, so we heard one of the panelists mention that there's five million images of child sexual abuse being harvested from UK servers over, I didn't actually catch the time span in which you harvest these materials. Um, at the same time, we don't seem to have a very good consensual definitions, even in this room, about what a child sex sexual abuse image would actually be. The Council of Europe says that they strongly encourage um, signatory states to the Cybercrime Convention not to make exceptions for images that are uh, virtual, as in cartoons, for instance, a cartoon of somebody who could conceivably be perceived as a child engaging in some kind of sexual activity. This clearly is not um, a definition which aims in any way to protect children. It aims at projecting a specific form of morality on adults. Such a provision in the law can only be seen as targeting adults and in no way is relating to protecting a real physical child who might be in danger. I would wish that we in child protection debates could, be, could focus our debate more on facts. What are the actual problems? We've heard about the cross-jurisdictional problem. How do you trace material to to other countries? How do you give sufficient law enforcement, like resources to law enforcement to help children? Now, I come from a city in Sweden where in the areas of the city, you would expect children to have things to tell the police. They closed down all the local police officer and instead offices and instead built an administrative palace in the center of the city. I don't discourage the police from engaging in bureaucracy, of course, but I don't think that children will normally ditch a school for two hours every third Thursday in order to spend those five minutes telling the police officer maybe something they want to tell them in confidence. If we wanted to, if we had as a society a genuine interest in helping children who are in exposed positions, we would make sure that law enforcement is easily accessible to them as a stabilizing force in society, and we're not. We're sitting here talking about images that we don't know how to define and that don't even contain real children in them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hannah. Who would like to respond? I can only really respond from an IWF point of view. Um, we can only take action on on what's been passed in the UK law. So we don't devise law, we don't lobby law. So if you want to take that up in the UK, you'd have to lobby the UK government or your fellow members of the European Parliament. But also just to state that uh, as far as child protection, that when the IWF are taking action against an image, the abuse has already taken place. We're not protecting a child. We're protecting the re-victimization of a child. So we're, we don't want that child to have to go through 
continued people looking at the image over and over and over again and continuing to reflect on the, on the abuse that did take place. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll uh, respond to the, the last speaker from the Swedish Pirate Party. As far as I understood uh, part of the point that was being made, it was that because the police are not properly resourced to do their job, and we regret that, we shouldn't do our job. We shouldn't focus on other things that we can do. I would like to see the police forces being properly resourced. Of course, who wouldn't? Everybody would. But unless we can't wait until the perfect day arrives when every police force in the world has got every piece of equipment and has got every facility laid on for them before we also address those things that are within our ambit and within our purview to to address. It's, it's, it's not a choice, it's a false trade-off. It's a completely bogus, phony, political argument. It's empty point scoring, it's sloganizing, it's not serious. The second point, uh, there is evidence, there is evidence uh, that the guys who collect these types of images that you say are not about a real child, you say it's about attacking adults, not protecting children, absolutely the opposite. The guys who collect those images are the same guys who collect all of the other images. They do form a way of normalizing, of legitimizing, of, of, uh, of, of somehow socializing the notion that it's okay to sexually abuse children or for adults to have sex with children. We say no. We say no civilized society should legitimize or socialize those types of image, images because they put children at risk. I don't care what adults do privately, I do care when what they do privately or publicly puts children in danger and those cartoons and those images do that even if a real child is not shown as being depicted within it. Thank you. Gentlemen. Um. Now it's on. Hello, Jonas from Akina, Finland. Uh, thanks for taking all this into account, but really I need to answer the call here. Uh, this has to be a realistic thing. We are all very seriously concerned about abuse, and we, our actions have to rely on actual data. And we see information, statistics, from, for example, from Japan, that having all these child-appearing materials circulating around and being absolutely legal there, they are diminishing the amount of sexual abuse. We have to take this into account. And I wouldn't, and, and really, if, 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 if the message is so, is so big about pictures that, are, that uh, in this case are not even related to actual production or abuse of children, then it, this goes to very much in the, in the appointment of art also, because if you look into the history or even modern days, it would be a really big problem to censor all that. So I, I hope this will be irrelevant in the future debates. And concerning the goal, which was also mentioned, that, okay, the primary thing is, of course, relieving the abuse, because that's the real problem. Why are we not having this workshop about tracing from the, the, the background, the whole source, then? We are treating the effect, not the cause. Again, I can only talk from the UK perspective, and I can't talk about the, the work that the child protection agencies do, but they, they do debate about trying to work out toolkits to try and um, to try and work out when the abuse is taking place. They do work with law enforcement to try and see that, and social workers, when they visit people's houses in the UK, whether or not abuse could be taking place. And I completely agree. If we could, if we could eradicate child sexual abuse and they weren't posted on the uh, internet, absolutely fine. We could all go home happy that we'd achieved it. But we live in a realistic world and people are going to abuse children and they are going to take pictures and they are going to post them online. But all we can really do is try and find out as quickly as possible when they've been posted online. Again, I can only talk from an IWF point of view and then take action and leave the professionals in social workers to try and try and recognize when that abuse is taking place. But by the very nature of it, people are going to try and keep it a secret. Yeah, um, I just want to add something and uh, I just want to bring everybody back that this is an online child protection workshop and um, we are we, we're, we're addressing that. Um, 
I just want to remind everybody. The gentleman in the striped shirt. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Alex Komninos. Um, I'm with the Association for Progressive Communications. Um, I was a bit misled because I forgot to read the subtitle. <laughs> it said child protection. Um, but I'm wondering if I could uh, use this opportunity and, and I, I see with, there's two, two issues here that, that perhaps need to be integrated. Um, and the one is the, is the much bigger problem of, of, of actual child abuse. Um, a child is most likely to be abused by someone that they know, uh, someone in their home, um, which makes, makes, makes reporting very hard. It also does make social work quite hard. Um, and um, I can possibly see the, the internet as offering opportunities to children there. Um, so we've, we've talked about um, protecting children through removing child pornography. How can the internet actually be used uh, for children to protect themselves and how can the, the internet be used as a tool to protect children? Uh, and I'm wondering, um, is, yeah, can these approaches be integrated or do we, do we need to divide them into two separate issues in their own little silo? Thank you. Sorry, I, I can try and answer that one. Um, it is a very difficult one. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of the internet. I come from a technology background. I've worked on the internet. So I would like to think that it can be used to, to help. And by means of allowing children to be able to access experts, to be able to um, communicate with people who can help them, I think the internet can really help um, there. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by how, how can they both, how can we stop the images being distributed and help the children? I, I do think that they're, they're two separate issues. I'm not quite sure I understood your question there. No. Yes, no, I understand that. But um, are you talking about how can children be protected? How can they report their abuse within their family? Then I think the internet can really help with that. Absolutely fine. Um, and it could link into the, the work that social teams do to try and work out whether or not there's been images taken in that home. But again, I can't really talk for the social workers in, in, in the world. There's somebody over here can, though. Um, hi, I'm Veronica. I'm also from Child Focus. I'm a Belgian NGO uh, that deals with missing children, sexually exploited children, and also with e-safety issues. We have a hotline, but also a helpline running at our center. And actually, uh, I think it's a very important point that you're raising here because I think that there are lots of centers, at least in Europe, that I'm aware of, that we're actually using the internet as a way of helping sexually abused children. We currently have a small, a very small European project within the Daphne program, which is actually about um, its um, action research on how to help sexually abused children to, to find ways online to, for help. So for instance, we developed a chat where children who have been sexually abused can contact us. And what we see, it's actually what you're saying, it's mainly uh, children who've been abused within their own families, the ones who contact us. And um, it's these children who actually are also afraid of uh, going to the police because they don't want to report their father or their older brother or someone within the family because uh, they don't want to destroy their family. So there are very, very big issues regarding these. We've, we are also contacting other helplines from all over Europe because we have issues and, and there are, there's lots to be done in that area, especially regarding, for instance, professional secrecy or where do we, when do we have to contact the police? What kinds of protocols should we do? Should we contact the police at all? Some helplines don't, uh, like in, in Sweden, for instance, they, they do respect the child's uh, right to privacy at most. In other countries, these centers are obliged to report. So, so I do think there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of potential there, but also lots of discussions need to be raised in terms of the protocols behind these kinds of services. Or what if you have a chat and then you can um, trace the IP address of the child, would you send the police to their home because this child is being abused? So I think there's lots to be done, but 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 there is a, uh, there are uh, there is there are initiatives in Europe, and I think that this is a good platform to to make it known, to also involve members of of parliament, to involve policymakers, and to help us uh, join these these initiatives also 
So I think it's a good, it, this is a great platform to, to refer to these issues that you're saying. Maybe it's not exactly, it doesn't have to do necessarily with, with detecting images of child abuse, but also the other side of the coin. I mean, we have the victims and we have to do something with them and help them. Thank you. Um, Julia and then the gentleman in the suits, Susie and Jan and the lady behind you. Thank you so much, Lara. Um, I am really apologize, I missed the beginning of the workshop, so I don't know if it was uh, brought to the table, but uh, we were speaking the last 10 minutes about images and pictures. So my question is, what about audio files? It's also an issue, and uh, in, the major, well, in a number of um, legal instruments we don't file, actually. We don't find this, um, this issue to be, um, to be addressed. Um, other thing, I completely agree with Lara, what you were saying, we don't we speak about child pornography or child and protection, which is, uh, if we speak uh, about child and protection, what about data protection, privacy, identity governance, e-commerce issues, they, all these issues should be uh, addressed and uh, we are supposed to discuss about. And another thing, um, we work a lot in France with youth and specifically with uh, youth from and young people from uh, uh, difficult areas of vulnerable youth. And I would like to bring other issues. For example, we, we know and we have statistics because we just finished, finalized one uh, um, sociological study on this. Um, we have a um, very big percentage of young people in difficult areas to be involved in criminal activities, for example, drug trafficking or prostitution. So what about the uh, online, I mean, what about these uh, young people and about the protection online? Thank you. Okay, um, I just want to go to the remote panelists and then we'll, we'll answer your question. It's another question on the remote. Yeah. Can you read it out? So we have. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We have Matt and Dave listening from from London, and they ask, um, given the good work of the IGF and Inhope within the current European Commission, CEO coalition, WG on CAM, working group on CAM, do you think a pan-European agreement and strategy is possible? Could it be a model internationally? Oh, was that IWF? In hope. In hope, did you say? No, pan European strategy coming out of the CEO coalition. Okay, do you want? Yeah, John? Yeah, okay. So, so um, <coughs> last December, uh, Vice President Cruz, Commissioner Cruz of the, uh, the Dutch Commissioner in the European Commission, <coughs> she laid down the challenge to the internet industry across the whole of Europe, which effectively meant globally, of course, because they're all global companies who, who, who play in the, that space. And she gave them five challenges, five areas where she wanted them to uh, not debate, not philosophize, not get into a huge amount of angst about what's exactly the, you know, what's the right uh, approach for this fine point or that small point but to make progress under these five headings and if I can remember them this is a brave man speaking now uh, if I can remember them one was to do with uh, speeding up the takedown times of child abuse images one was to do with developing more age-appropriate privacy settings one was to do with developing uh, better content classification tools one was to do with better reporting tools and the fifth one I've forgotten, it's prob sorry? Oh yeah, and the fifth one was for the companies to develop better, uh, easier to use parental controls. And we, the companies, so this is an industry-led uh, initiative stimulated by Commissioner Cruz's demand. There's lots and lots of activity being taking place. It's all now coming to a head. I think by the end of December this year, they have to, all, all of these different five working groups have to report back on what they're planning to do to meet Commissioner Cruz's requests. Uh, and then I think by June of next year, they're meant to have implemented all of the things that they said they were going to do in response to uh, Commissioner Cruz's request. And we're, we're, I mean, from a child protection point of view, from our point of view, uh, it's, we've been fully engaged in the process. We've commented at every stage on everything that the industry has said. We've relied a lot on the research from EU Kids Online and from other sources. It's very much been evidence-based and evidence-led. Will it work? Well, let's see. Let's, let's, next, this time next year, We'll be back in Indonesia, I think it's going to be, next time. 
uh, with the IGF, we'll see. Uh, there's certainly a lot of energy, a lot of thought, a lot of very clever people have been focusing on it. It's very, very ambitious, uh, but I guess it needed to be, um, and we'll, we'll see. But if it works, then yes, absolutely. So it's a pan-European strategy. It could be taken up, because let's remember, these companies, they're all global players. What they're doing in Europe, they're doing in Latin America, they're doing in North America, they're doing in all parts of Asia. So if we can get it to work in Europe, where there is this pressure from Commissioner Cruz, it could even be a global strategy. So watch this space. Gentleman in the suit. Yeah, my name is Georg Ermann. I'm a member of um, the Inexo delegation, lawyer from Germany, specialized for victims of sexual abuse. Concerning your words to Tokyo, to Japan, I spent one week in June in Tokyo of invitation of the government because of the circumstance in this country. Uh, also, the possession of uh, child pictures and films is not a crime in Japan, one of, one of the five countries in the world, which is not so. The circumstances in Japan are like in England or in Germany in the 50s. This society begins to open now, and now it, they begin to, 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 uh, to begin the procedures and the development we had in the last 30 years. This is the reason why the number of crimes is so low in Japan, not because of the mangas are free. And now they start this development and they invited us to, to make it. Now they change the law and the discussion is whether mangas will be a crime or not. But now they start this and they will make a law to, to make it. This uh, concerning to Tokyo. I think the question must be not the question how to, uh, how to give children the chance to be protected is important. But the question at the IGF also must be how can w what measures could be taken that the so-called pedophiles, the pedocriminals, doesn't misuse the internet. And therefore we need perhaps technical responses, we need the community, we need in-hope. But these are the, the questions I'm here for to hear. What can we do that the pedophiles or the pedocriminals don't misuse the net? Because we love the net with all those chances. But there are guys who are misusing it. And this is not an attack against freedom of speech or freedom of the internet. I think this is a problem the pirates have. No, let's fight together against those pedophiles and against the pedocriminals misusing the net. Um, we're just going to get a mic over to uh, Susie. It's on its way, it's on its way. And then we'll have Anjan after Susie. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, my name's Susie Hargreaves. I'm from the Internet Watch Foundation, um, and I just wanted to. I very much liked your last comment and totally agree with you. I just wanted to respond to the issue about being about child uh, children being abused and child protection versus uh, protecting children on the net and actually then removing images, which is what we do. And I just want to say that. The way we work in the UK, it's very much we're part of an overall picture. We're very specific in terms of what we do, but we're very well connected across the board. So uh, we are part of the Safer Internet Centre for the UK with our two partners, uh, Childnet International and Southwest Grid for Learning, who do a lot of that work supporting children and child education on how to make themselves safe on the net. But also we are members of the UK Council for Child Internet Safety, so we're also engaging on a much wider level with all the key players. And then again, we also engage with organizations like the NSPCC, child charity, children's charities. So we, we very much see ourselves as part of the overall picture, but we are very, very specific. So what we do is we take action on images on the internet and we work with partners on that basis. So, but it's not see in isolation, we realize. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Susie and Jean. Um, I'm Anjan Bose from Ekpat International. Uh, we are an international network combating sexual exploitation of children, not only online but other manifestations. Um, just want to make a point regarding what was said about internet being used, online services being used when there is a form of violence happening within the family. Uh, I would just like to add that it's not only the children that you know need to report. Uh, we had 
cases this year, three already, where the, you know, the husband was the offender, the perpetrator, and the wife wanted to report. And the only way they could report, I had one from Mexico, I had one from Singapore. I wouldn't give the in individuals, but we, we are seeing that very often that family members also want to report. And there are not services that are present in the country that allows you to have accessible form of reporting, um, whether it's a lack of hotlines or lack of services that is uh, you know, transparent to them. So having an online service and make them aware of those really helps. And then you know, these are ways where they can actually use online uh, services. I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you. And the lady behind you? Forgotten your name. So, um, yes. Um, I take notice of the fact that you don't remember my name, so I will reintroduce myself. I'm Elia Andersdotter. I am a member of the European Parliament on behalf of the Pirate Party. I think that it's slightly disingenuous of John Carr to insinuate that I don't care about children. The last time that we discussed child pornographic images in Sweden, I was of the age that I was actually personally affected by the legislation that was being discussed in that it removed from me the autonomy to control what was happening with my body in terms of photographic images because I was 17 actually at that time and this law makes everyone under 18 uh, cut off from defining what happens with themselves in a social context on the internet. I think that it's not so much to ask that we can also discuss these, is these issues with child protection. What is it that we're actually trying to protect and why? And is this online child protection with with images or parental filters, the best way of doing so. Because I must ask, the chat services, how will the chat services that you're trying to launch to help children help themselves online be affected by the net neutrality problem, for instance, if an internet service provider is able to determine which services reach the end consumers and which not? Can your chat service actually be accessible to all children? If you leave it to the parents to decide which information is accessible to the children and not by promoting filtering technologies and making special technological solutions for this, is it possible for you to guarantee that all of these technological implementations that you're using public money to develop will actually be accessible and useful to anyone? And I want uh, I think that the child protection lobby, if they are interested in launching these tools, um, should uh, join us in the fight for net neutrality regulation at the European level. It is very important that we maintain the internet as an open platform for, for instance, exploring opportunities for children to empower themselves or for the wives of abused children, uh, of husbands who, <laughs> not abused children, but you know. So that, they can, so that they can also participate. And this way, maybe you would do some use to the world instead of engaging in these activities which have an obvious risk of mission creep in terms of freedom of speech. And I think the Russian internet filter that they are implementing now, we will see where that ends up in terms of more government control over freedom of speech in that country. Because we in Europe, with the help of John Carr, for instance, were the ones who came up with that idea first. And now it risks doing serious harm to the democratic debate of a country very close to us. Thank you. Do you want to speak? OK. Um, OK, thank you. We need a microphone down the s Can you pass the microphone? Can you get the microphone? Thank you. Yes, hello. My name is Eric Creer, and uh, I'm representing the SNG Luxembourg, which is the national youth service in Luxembourg. But uh, also, I'm representing here the InSafe Network, and. Uh, I would like actually to first give any, if you want to react on the last talk, because I actually have a question which goes in a slightly different uh, reaction. First of all, I can say one thing about the interconnecting of the uh, virtual world and the real world. Uh, we supported Ekpat Luxembourg actually in a project where they were doing a research on what actually is promoting sex tourism, for instance, not just to Asia, but also for instance, there is now uh, tourism in the northern African countries, uh, because this also concerns, for instance, then the exploitation of, of kids. So. 
I think there is a clear link between trying to keep the net clean because this really does not promote an, uh, certain uh, tendencies of people. It does not emphasize their l search for instant and finding this somewhere and even paying for this as a service in a, in a touristic destination. So just to, to make the link between, as you said, the real world and the physical world, uh, we need, as you said in the beginning, to um, have all the power that we have on the side of the police forces to really ensure action if something is bad. But we also need to keep the internet clean. I think that's more or less what is the message here, that we should not hide behind the neutrality of the net. If we talk about, and then we don't talk about 17-year-olds, but we talk about uh, even younger kids who get abused and where from then um, pictures might circulate on the internet. I would like to come back to a comment which was done at the very beginning from the panel. Um, because that's something where now you said with the current uh, discussions that went on, we have technologies, for instance, to trace uh, images which are on the web, but um, from discussions that happened already uh, yesterday and uh, in the morning, um, I would like to know, so what is then the current status about initiatives towards then how can we see what's circulating on social networks and for instance, what is um, put and where is it put on clouds? Because that's now the new hiding platform for certain content and the ones who really make business out of child pornography, they always know where to find the places where there is, at the moment, tec technically, um, yeah, a, a certain difficulty to access it and to identify even the origin of the content. So maybe there you have some uh, current developments to share with us. Is anybody from Microsoft in the room? I can't, I can't see. No, OK. So it, specifically in relation to social networking, uh, sites to, to answer your question directly. Uh, Microsoft have uh, made available a, uh, a program called PhotoDNA uh, which uh, uses uh, what you, well, hash-based images and of known images as a means of preventing them being uploaded to social networking sites in the first place. And Facebook are already de deploying this technology so if, if you try to post onto Facebook a child abuse image that's already been seized and is already known by the police somewhere in the world, it shouldn't be possible for it to appear on Facebook in the first place because of the photo DNA technology which Microsoft uh, developed. If there is any query about the image or if it's uh, potentially a false positive or something of that kind, my understanding is that the image is rooted to a human being within Facebook's company who look at the image with their own eyes and they make a decision about whether or not it is a child abuse image. So that's, that's a really uh, important development. The same technology could be used in a cloud environment. Uh, I mean, the cloud, the cloud doesn't fundamentally change any, anything from a, jurist, uh, from a legal point of view. The issue about the cloud is it makes it harder potentially to determine the jurisdiction within which the, a crime needs to be prosecuted or a, or a legal action might need to be commenced. But in principle, the, the existence of the cloud doesn't change anything fundamentally uh, from a legal point of view. As I say, from a practical point of view, it may well do, but from a legal point of view, uh, uh, it doesn't. Photo DNA is a, an example of what I think of being a, an excellent technical response uh, from the industry because Microsoft don't make any money out of it, they give it away. Uh, my complaint is that we haven't got more programs like Photo DNA because some people rightly, rightly worry if there's only one supplier, if there's only a monopoly supplier. And at the moment, M Microsoft is the only company that's done anything like that and made it available. I think it's, you can't criticize Microsoft for doing that. Uh, it was a very generous thing and a very good thing that they did. If, I could if there's any criticism to be handed out, it's at other companies who haven't done something similar. Because it's not good to only have one technical solution or only one company's products. We should see other companies stepping up and making similar technical tools available. Thank you. The, the, the gentleman over there. Yeah, yeah, no, we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let her call. She's, she's from the UN. Yeah. Go on. I did call her. I did yeah, call no, 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 she was going to step down. Now?
Thank you. So my name is Maria Herzog and I'm representing here the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. So I would like to come back to um, the approach of uh, freedom of speech and uh, unfiltered internet. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert on the internet and uh, um, images on it, but I hope that I'm an expert on child rights. Now, if you want to challenge the issue of uh, under the age of 18, you should um, let children be shown on the internet or cause harm to them, then you have to challenge the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child because so far, for 23 years now, there is a global agreement that everyone is a child under the age of 18 uh, and therefore they are eligible for special protection. And so in case we want to challenge this, we should discuss what are the arguments um, against this uh, the convention and its um, binding uh, conditions. Also, it's a comprehensive set of values and standards. So it is not worth picking one or the other <coughs> issue out of it because then we can start from scratch, so to say. Another issue is obviously how can we provide um, the maximum freedom possible, as we all wish, but at the same time protecting those who are vulnerable. But I guess uh, that, is, that is a much more complex issue and goes over the issues of child protection. It starts much earlier. The question is obviously how can we strengthen each and every child uh, and how can we support the parents to, and the communities uh, to be able protecting them in an appropriate way, Why, at the same time providing them with the opportunity to express their views, to be heard, and also to have access to internet and any other sources of information and uh, other opportunities. Thank you. Um, the Thank you. And now, yeah, now it works, finally. Uh, I am uh, Orvan Parfentiev, uh, I represent Russian Safe Rankness Center um, and uh, Emerging Russian National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, so actually my question was inspired by uh, John's remark about photo-DNA. So it was discussed on uh, free actions, uh, really good software too, of the uh, position that in the uh, children to national uh, political and civil rights, which says that uh, uh, the top priority are uh, the, uh, the interests for moral and health of people, including children. And to my mind, uh, uh, European Human Rights Court uh, put the right of children uh, for protection over the right for self-expression. Uh, so we have photo DNA, which ensures this right and which allows to find on the internet the images uh, similar to one tract. So we can remove the image. But uh, we know that uh, photo DNA has a great minus, like if you uh, modify image a little bit, the hash value of the image uh, changes and photodNA uh, cannot properly react and find uh, the image. Uh, John was saying that probably similar uh, solutions uh, should uh, appear. Uh, how do you think uh, uh, can the technology go over and uh, what else could be added to search uh, on the base of hash value? Uh, in order to find uh, similar child abusive images online uh, and uh, to um, uh, make it so that if the image was a little bit modified it will be still automatically found proactively and thrown uh, to the human analyst. Uh, so how could it be? Thanks. Oh, sorry, my point was simply that more companies than Microsoft should be doing this because it's not good to be in a position where only one company is supplying one product. It's 10 out of 10, you know, big round of applause to Microsoft for doing it. It's not a criticism of Microsoft, absolutely the opposite. But I would like to see more companies being the same generous 
pioneering, doing the same sort of generous and pioneering work. I think in the end we will beat this problem. I do, I do genuinely think, I do see progress in lots of areas. I think we will beat it, but we'll only beat it because people like we've got in this room, or at any rate most of the people that we've got in this room, uh, are, are focusing on it and making it a top priority and are not getting it mixed up with a whole set of other issues which are quite tangential uh, to the main issue. Sorry, sir. If I may just take one second to respond to Irvin, I think wh what we discussed this morning uh, about the photo DNA is exactly, you know, to address what you raised. Uh, the photo DNA technology does what the previous hash technologies didn't. So if you change the file name, if you crop the image if you do it's it's a different algorithm that they have developed only to address that that change of the file size or um, editing the image will not create a different hash value it will remain the same so even if you do it you will still be able to match it with the original image I think that's the beauty of photo DNA um, just uh, picking up on the point that you made behind uh, me um, you know, I you know I have children like lots of people here who are and have one under 18, one over 18, and it is my responsibility as a parent to decide, you know, to give them parental guidance, and that's what I do. But I also wanted to point out that the images that we see, 70% of the images we saw last year were of children under 10, and 8% were of children under 2, and we are talking about the rape and sexual torture of those children and we're talking about their human rights. So this is not about borderline, are they 16, 17? This is about very, very young children who cannot protect themselves in the main. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Uh, we have one last comment from Alexander and yourself, and then we'll close. Okay, now every third time it works. I, I wanted to also follow what, what Anshan said. This is the, the whole point about photo DNA, the way I understand it, that you can have similar images and you can detect. And it's also not just, cannot just be used for removing images, but also for investigating, for tracing, identifying, and rescuing victims. You may have an image of one child in a certain setting, you find a similar setting with a different child and see, you, you, you make, you'll be able to make connections. Also, you may find the same child in different settings. You may not get a clue for an investigation in one, but in another one, you may find a, a Pepsi bottle in the background with a certain language where this is produced, and you can and, and find and, and trace victims. I've seen presentations of how this has led to major international operations to rescue child victims from exploitation. I've also seen presentations on horrible situations of a a two-year-old child being raped and, and abused, the same image, the same child two years later as a four-year-old, again, still raped and abused. And again, as a six or seven-year-old, the same child raped and abused, and they have not been able, at that time, for the DNA was not yet there. But there are real victims. It's not just something of imagination. Just to, uh, maybe I would recommend that the uh, lady from the Pirate Party, we have spent a few days with some of these child protection agencies to get a real, a real impression of what the problem is, and maybe then we can come to a more sensible discussion. Thank you, Alexander. Last one, and then we're closing. Yeah, um, no, I just wanted to, to, to raise a point that, uh, Amelia, I haven't forgotten your name, <laughs> and uh, probably, and I'm sure that we are far from where we should be, that there's a lot to be, there's lots to be done in terms of child protection, and especially if we are using online technologies to try to help children. But um, you would be surprised if you, uh, and you are not gonna see them because the logs we keep are, are private and we don't share them with anyone. But children who contact us via the chat and via these services, they, they tell us, I mean, it's the only place where I can talk to someone. I don't dare to talk to anyone about it. So when you have children telling you that you are doing a job helping them, 
I mean, the, the internet, there are many issues still out there, but there are many children who don't have the chance to talk to their parents because they're abusing them. They cannot tell their children, uh, their, their friends, because they feel ashamed of it. So they need a place to be, and the internet, it's a place that can also offer that. They don't want to phone because they said, if I phone a service, a social service, my uh, the, the, the telephone bill can, can uh, tell my parents that I've been calling someone. So for many of these children, the chat and, and other online services, not just the chat, but there are social services and many other technologies being used to help children in the context where they need it. But we're also trying to, to work with industry. We're trying to work with other, with other uh, stakeholders to see what are the ways so that we can actually protect children the way they need to be protected. So there are some services where you close the chat and automatically all the history is deleted. So uh, actually, okay, the abuser, if it's close to them, cannot have access to it. So so I do think that you, ha you make a point in the sense that it should be safe. It's not the idea that a child is chatting and then afterwards the parent's gonna find out about that and then the, the child is gonna be in, in a worse situation than it was before contacting a social service. But we don't need to think about the way forward and what children need to be really protected okay. online. And we are working towards that direction, but if we don't discuss it here with the industry, with, the, with government, with all the necessary agencies, I mean, we cannot improve the services, but we are helping children, I can assure you that. Okay, um, thank you very much for your contributions. I would like to thank our panelists, Sandra, John. Fred and Tracy. Um, the numbers that Sandra was referencing will be published on the Commonwealth IGF website next week and the updated toolkit will be available online towards the end of this year. Thank you very much.